that the government decided to find a way to pay back all the external debt. And the way how they did that was that they basically starved their own citizens. They cut down the heating, they cut down the electricity, they cut down the food and everything. So it became a very dark and dire time. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Emanuela Grammer was born in the mid-1970s in a small provincial town in eastern Romania. She provides us with some great insight into life in the Romanian provinces during the 1980s. She lived in a small two-bedroom flat and tells of her parents working in a factory while her grandparents looked after her. Her father listened secretly to Radio Free Europe and collected stamps so that he could legitimately write to people in the West. Her parents told her not to talk at school about what was said at home and to be very careful what she said to her friends. Emanuela vividly recalls the day the revolution started in 1989. She was at home alone and she describes the instant atmosphere of change and the weeks and months thereafter. We also hear about Emanuela's book, Socialist Heritage, The Politics of Past and Place in Romania. Now, I'm asking listeners to support my work to enable me to continue recording these quite frankly incredible stories if you become a monthly supporter via patreon you will get the sought after cold war conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve cold war history just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate if you can't wait for next week's episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where guests and listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. James Chilcott is our host for this week's episode, so I'm delighted to welcome James and Emanuela to our Cold War conversation. I uh, uh, was born in Romania in um, summer of, uh, in the summer of 1975. Um, so uh, the end of the regime, I basically grew up throughout uh, the late communist period. Um, I am currently now a professor of uh, history and anthropology at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, the U.S. Um, um, and I've been living in the U.S. for almost uh, 20 years. So, so you you were born in seventy five in Romania. Whereabouts in Romania were you born, and what was it like uh, the area where you lived? So, um, I was born in a small uh, provincial town uh, in eastern um, Romania. Uh, that mm, town is called Focșan. Um, it's um, it's just uh, the quintessence of a, of a provincial town. It was relatively small, around uh, maybe not so small, but definitely small by the, the standards of, of a city. Um, and uh, it was uh, just an ordinary town uh, whose history, I have to admit, uh, it was rather an unknown history to me at the time when I was growing up. What I mean by that is that much later, when I started actually uh, conducting uh, research in Romania and uh, doing uh, interviews and also reading other you know materials about Romania at the interwar time, uh, it turned out that my own hometown uh, turned out to be uh, a town with a significant Jewish population uh, that left uh, after the Second World War. And uh, so there was this history that I actually learned about much later in my adulthood. Uh, so there were many somehow uh, hidden histories of of this of this town that seemed to be uh, very homogeneous uh, from from an ethnic perspective of the time I was growing up. Was that history talked about um, while you were growing up? Was it part of the 
socialist academic um, curriculum? No, not at all. Definitely not. Uh, so first of all, from my personal experience, I never heard about the presence of the uh, the Jewish uh, uh, Jewish people in my town uh, until much, much later, maybe 20 years uh, or, I don't know, 15 years later. Definitely at the time when I started doing my PhD and started really learning about it. Also, during the time of my growing up, no one would really mention the histories of, of the Romanian Jews. This was uh, definitely a taboo topic or very few people would talk about. Um, and uh, all the history that we learned in school was very much focusing on, on Romanian history, right? It was very much part of the context in which um, uh, the Ceausescu uh, led the government focused highly on developing, um, um, you know, a, a history, a socialist history with heavy nationalist tones, and therefore, uh, anything that was taught in school was about Romania and Romanians. Uh, the fact that Romania was uh, had a history, uh, a much more complex his- history of uh, heterogeneous, um, heter- hetero- uh, uh, ethnic heterogeneity, uh, and the presence of a large Jewish population as well as as other minority uh, or ethnic groups was not something my- much mentioned during my uh, during my education. And tell me more about your education. Um, was it a very formal system? Was there much selectivity as you went through? Or was it a fairly preordained path when you started out? Oh, it was a fairly preordained path in the sense that everyone white would just follow a rhythm of life that was relatively ordinary because right, that was the only ordinariness that would be um you know imaginable to each uh, Romanian citizen who was living at that time the, the the possibility of leaving the country almost did not exist uh it was very hard for people to i mean it was really impossible for a Romanian citizen to get a, a passport to to visit um uh you know western countries especially if you didn't have the so called connections uh that is a uh, very special ways in which to obtain this passport but for an ordinary person with without such connections uh this was rather impossible so which means that the education that anyone would have uh, i mean i'm talking about from my perspective as a as a child um was yeah a uh, very uh, uh, it, it was it it was nothing um, I don't know what nothing special about it, but what I'm trying to say is, it it, it was what other people would do, and uh, the possibility of trying to do something else or imagining something else was was rather uh, n- not uh, you know within the horizon. So, so you used a very interesting expression, the rhythm of life. What was the rhythm of life like for you and your family? Was it a fairly happy uh, path or or did your parents um, have particular views about the regime which they had to hide? What was that rhythm of life like for you and for you as a family? So um, I would have to say that... Uh, my parents were rather ordinary people. They both uh, were they are smart people, but at the same time, for instance, uh, neither of them went to college. So they both went to technical schools. And then they found a job uh, as a white collar job um, in, um, in a factory uh, in the city. So um, there was not much that, that they, um, I mean, and they got ma- married and they had me. And then basically my grandparents were helping uh, a lot uh, them. They were helping them a lot, raising me. So um, is that quite normal for grandparents to play a big part in looking after the children while the parents went to work? Especially at that time, I would say, absolutely. It was like we were definitely a generation. So the generation that I uh, was part of was the generation of uh, that was described in Romanian as the, the generation with the key around their neck. What means what that means exactly is that um, many of the kids who do, did not have grandparents living in uh, the same uh, town or the same um 
uh, setting as their parents meant that they would come back from school with holding the key of their apartment around their neck so they wouldn't lose it. They would open the door of their apartment. They would get in. They would make sure they would eat something. They would do homework by themselves. Uh, then maybe get out in front of the apartment building and start playing with other kids who also have their kids around their necks until uh, basically the parents will show up from work, which was around four or five. So the so-called after school that many, many kids right now are part of as a way of really continuing education and finding, you know, a structure for the time in between ending uh, the end of school and the time when parents finish work uh, was, in fact, uh, you know, uh, taking care of yourself for many of these kids. My situation was particular precisely because my parents were able or they chose not to go somewhere else which meant that they lived in the same town with my grandparents. And automatically, my grandparents were able to, I mean, I lived most of the time with my grandparents. I lived there, especially during the winters with my grandparents, because they um, had a house, which was very unusual for that time, which meant that they were able to heat up the house independently, right? With uh, They had uh, wooden stoves and they were able to do so. This is particularly important at the time uh, in at that time in Romania when um, around ninety uh, uh, in um, early nineteen eighties. Uh, so I was already six, right, uh, uh, five six. So uh, this is I'm jumping out now to a broader context. So Ceausescu, the leader of the country, decided to um, stop paying. To, they, 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 um, that the government decided to find a way to pay back all the external debt. And the way how they did that was that they basically starved their own citizens. They cut down the heating, they cut down the electricity, they cut down the food and everything. So it became a very dark and dire time. Uh, many people were like freezing in their apartments because the heat was not available. And Anyone who lives in an apartment building will be dependent on the heat from the state, with the exceptions of the people who had their own houses and were able to, to heat up the houses in, in independent ways. So my grandparents were one of, uh, you know, were part of this much smaller category of people. And consequently, <laughs> I basically lived my entire, you know, uh, six, six, five months per year up to four years uh, with my grandparents. Why were they lucky enough to have a house? Oh, yes, this is a very important point too. So um, I will just for the, you know, I am also a historian. I'm also someone who experienced that time. I also am moving in between contexts or so I'm moving from my personal experience to a broader context. So the broader context that um, uh, we have to, uh, to to be aware of when we understand the situation is that so the socialist government in Romania tried very hard to radically um, change the urban texture of the cities. They uh, that the point of transforming the urban fabric into uh, socialist modern cities was a key uh, point on uh, the political agenda. Um, what happened is that they had to really change a lot because most of the uh, most of the smaller cities were very much formed as individual houses and less apartment uh, uh, with much much fewer apartment buildings in my in my specific town uh there were no apartment buildings right before uh the second world war and they started building these new apartment buildings by demolishing all the individual houses um my parents lived in a neighborhood uh where they would see the bulldozers in other neighborhoods coming closer and closer and closer and closer. And uh, for many years, almost decades, they, they lived in the fear that these bulldozers will eventually get on their street, they will demolish their house, and then oh, them and uh, all their other neighbors would actually be moved forcefully uh, into living in apartment buildings. So they were lucky that didn't happen. But... Um, they were lucky in many respects. So this is how it happened to, to, for me to be able to also live in a house throughout the, the communist times. Was it, was it luck or was it connections or was it heritage or something they'd done in the past that enabled them to be in that 
fairly privileged position? I would say it was rather luck. It was so. What that's fascinating when I or you have to imagine the picture of uh, apartment buildings being uh, rising uh, as we speak. Uh, uh, you can see the more and more new apartment buildings rising that you can see from my my grandparents' uh, courtyard. Uh, and eventually, by the time of the end of the regime in 1989, there were two streets that separated my grandparents' street and, of course, the house from that from from the new apartment buildings. Uh, so I would say it was luck because um, it was necessarily, or as far as I know, there were no necessarily no no connection. What happened is that the uh, local authorities focus on specific areas in the city. Uh, they build, they demolished neighborhoods, and then they build apartment buildings. So somehow, this the, the small neighborhood where my gr- grandparents lived became caught in between two modern neighborhoods of apartment buildings. So perhaps they were they 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 were just postponed in terms of uh, um, this specific neighborhood to be to be eventually demolished and uh, radically changed. And you mentioned that, you know, after you these children had gone home and uh, they sort themselves out, they go outside in front of their apartment block and play. When you weren't at school, what did you do um, uh, in your spare time? So um, I would play and I would read. <laughs> um, I also have to say that uh, uh, yet another another um, important part uh, of the socialist education in Romania was that du- uh, during 1970s, there was um, definitely a strategic opening towards the West. Uh, it was encouraged politically. Um, I, uh, let me actually rephrase it. Late, uh, so mid to late 60s, early 70s. Uh, during that time, there were a lot of translations done into Romanian uh, from Western literature, or world literature. So there were uh, uh, an amazing um, range of literature, fiction, nonfiction, uh, books translated from, uh, from this world literature into Romanian. So uh, if you really wanted to read, you could really read a lot and, uh, and become more familiar with um, with Western literature, especially, so was that a very was that a very curated list of books, and who decided what books it was appropriate to translate? That's a very good question. I don't have the answer for that, right? I'm a researcher. I want to make sure I base my answers. But uh, based on the variety of options, I would say it was um, it was less politically curated, if this is what you mean. So I basically read Honoré de Balzac, right, when I was ten. I read the entire Balzac. And then I'm, I'm, you know, moved to Victor Hugo and then to Alexandre Dumas. And then, so there was no such a sense uh, as, um, you know, the genre of young adult literature. I mean, that did not exist. So you basically moved from reading kids' book to like, if you are interested, to just adult fiction. You would just read all the fiction possible. And that's what I was doing. I, I had a lot of fun reading, a lot. <laughs> I would, basically, I remember that, um, so, I mean, if I can just uh, develop this a bit more, I had school uh, in my uh, from one to the fourth grade in the morning. But then once I switched to middle school, right, fifth grade to eighth grade, I started um, I started going to school in the afternoon because the idea was that there were not so, so many classrooms. So the classrooms had to be used twice per day to accommodate all the children and their needs. So I would go to school at 12 and I would come back around four or five together with my parents who who were coming back from work. But what I was doing every morning when they were uh, actually leaving for work had four hours per day when I was uh, reading only fiction because I had done my homework in the night before and I would just be happy to read. And that's exactly what I did. I read like nuts basically for four years of my life before I went to high school and before basically the regime collapsed. 
So that was basically an advantage to you, that liberalising of the access to literature. You're a big beneficiary of that. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. And I wasn't, right, I wasn't speaking English then. I wasn't, I was not able to learn, um, I was not able to read in other languages at that moment. So the only thing I would be able to read was Romanian. And I read every book I could find. And in terms of your experience at school, was that a... Uh, very formal experience was it all were you wearing uniforms was it how much freedom of speech do you have what was it like as a as a, as a school system yeah so definitely everyone was wearing uniforms I mean we were still part of the pioneers the young pioneers generation we had to have our own uh, you know special uh, little red uh, tie um and uh yeah so everyone had to wear uniforms um and there was i mean that was totally out of question to even consider wearing something else that like you will basically be kicked out of the school, of school you that would not be possible i do remember very specifically that sometimes they would come in and they would have special uh, official visits, um, not necessarily like really big shots in the political apparatus, but more like regional or local, you know, officials. And at that moment, every uh, the director of the school will come, the principal will come in every classroom and make sure everyone had, uh, every girl will wear this kind of, you know, white hairband and then uh, every boy would have, uh, you know, the, the shirt very well, uh, tied up and uh, uh, the, the, the uh, ties were supposed to, uh, you know, look perfect. Um, yeah. So in terms of uh, the aesthetics of the school, uh, yes, you had to definitely be uh, wearing uniforms and adhere to rather strict rules of uh, de- like demeanor. Uh, in terms of speech, I think that's a very important point. Uh, we were definitely told from the very beginning that that's definitely come, comes as part of growing up then, that whatever you would hear at, uh, in, at, at home, you would make sure that you will not repeat it at school. Um, and for instance, my, my father would actually listen to Radio Free Europe in the night. And what was very particular about it is that my, fa- uh, my parents were living in a two two room apartment not two bedroom two room apartment one they was their bedroom one was my bedroom and in order to, for him to let my mom sleep <laughs> he would come into my bedroom where he had his own desk and he would actually put the radio free europe on <laughs> while he was still working so <laughs> it's kind of strange a situation i really wonder how those if that information from Radio Free Europe, you know, got to percolate my unconscious, because sometimes I would wake up and listen to the to the news, and he was totally not aware of that. So anyway, uh, what I'm saying is, yes, it was very important to make sure that you would not talk about your parents or whatever parents would say at home, because you knew that you would get in trouble, and they will actually they could also go to jail. Basically, it's very simple. So as as part of a broader thing, though. So- at what age did you start to realize that you couldn't travel freely, that there was a securitate, that there was an apparatus of state that was quite repressive? Was that something that slowly emerged or did you sort of have an awakening at a sudden point? I would say it was both. I think uh, there was definitely a clear idea that you have to be very careful what you say to friends. Uh, at the same time, you know, my parents were not dissidents, um, uh, so they were just ordinary people. However, uh, if you are going to really say that your father will listen to Radio Free Europe, uh, that would be a serious problem. Uh, what I do remember specifically was an episode in which um, my father had a visitor. So first of all, just to contextualize, they didn't have a phone, Right. Uh, they, anyone could knock on the door and then you would open the door and invite them in. So, uh, and, um, my father was a big uh, stamp collector. And so he would actually have lots of, um, visitors to show and exchange those stamps. And the one moment I do remember it was, uh, is a, it was a weekend because everyone was at home and someone knocked at the door. Uh, my father opened the door, uh, that man came in. Uh, they shook hands and my father wa- uh, invited him to so-called his office, which was also my bedroom, to show his, him the stamps. It turned out that this guy was a um, local um, official related to the secret police. And uh, the radio 
uh, on my father's desk was obviously set on this frequency that anyone would know that that was the way how you catch free, uh, Radio Free Europe. It was not a frequency for like normal Romanian news. So <laughs> my father was freaking out for the entire visit uh, and we were not aware of. So the guy left. I'm not surprised. Yeah. I'm not surprised at so all. So they exchanged stamps. The guy left. We will never know if he noticed that and he didn't say anything. But my father definitely freaked out for many months after that visit because he always expected that someone else would knock at the door. And this time he will actually take be taken out from the apartment. And did you know of people that were um, taken away? No, I don't. I did not know. Or at least, yeah, I didn't. And I was a kid, right? Even if something happened, I think it would have been quite um, a radical experience. So my, so my parents probably would not have told me that. But uh, no, I had, I was, I didn't hear anything about uh, anyone happening something like this to anyone during the time I grew up. Do you still have your father's stamp collection? Uh, actually, no, no. He he still has some. He stopped collecting stamps a long time ago. Um, a long much late, much later, I realized why he was. He started collecting stamps. <laughs> It was a way for him to start exchanging um, letters with people living in the West. So what's interesting is that uh, his stamp collecting um, hobby turned out to be very uh, beneficial at the end of the regime, uh, precisely because he was able to connect with, to make um, like, you know, like kind of pen pals uh, with uh, people, especially in France. Uh, He learned French just for the sake of exchanging those letters and those stamps, which is quite amazing. And um, then at the end of the regime, everyone was like, oh my gosh, Romania, revolution, we have to find ways to really help those guys. And so we started getting lots of French chocolate from these guys. And so we ate lots of chocolate in 1990. So because of the stamp of people of France. That's not such a bad way, is it, to to, to collect stamps? yeah. That's true. Very clever. Yes, I know. I don't think he expected. He was, I think he really wanted to do something that would be definitely apolitical, but would also give him a taste of, you know, uh, a certain kind of aesthetic that was definitely not socialist. You would have turned about 14 in 1989 when uh, the Ceausescu regime finally fell. Mm-hmm. How do you become aware of that? And what do you feel when? Uh, in a way, all those certainties started to disappear overnight. Well, so I do remember a, a, a very distinctly um, the, 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 the day in which um, it fell. It was December 20, 22nd. And I was supposed to go to school. And I turned on the TV and I do remember that I was shocked. There was no one at home. I do remember that um, my parents were at work. I don't remember exactly what day of the week it was, but it definitely was a weekday. Uh, I can definitely check the calendar. And I turned on the TV because I was actually, I wanted to know uh, whether my t- w- uh, watch worked or not. I, I want to make sure be, I will be on time. So I turned on, my t- on the TV because I knew there would be news and then I wanted to just see uh <laughs> what time it was and then i see these people on the tv and i just didn't understand what was going on and i was by myself in the apartment with no phone uh i just it, everything was just so strange so i got out of the apartment and i went to see a friend of mine who was living in an apartment building right next door and i could see that everything like the entire you know, atmosphere had radically changed. It was such a strange sensation. Everyone was running on the street. People, Some people were even smiling, but with a smile that I had never seen in my life, like a bright, you know, uh, open, uh, radical smile. And some people were, you know, scared. You can see their eyes. And I was really trying to understand what was going on. And then I went to my friend and then uh, her mother told me that the regime ended, that Ceausescu fled. And then my mom came back from work. And then, um, oh, and I do remember very distinctively that we tried to go to see my grandparents. 
Uh, my grandparents lived on the other side of the town. So my parents lived in so-called industrial complex. It was a it was a neighborhood of a new neighborhood of apartment buildings that was the outskirts of the town. So we had to travel all across the city, the town, uh, to take the bus and get there. But what happened is that we got on the bus and uh, as soon as we were leaving this neighborhood to get into um, into the other part of the town, into uh, downtown and then uh, later eastern part where my grandparents lived, uh, we had to pass by a military um, uh, station. Uh, and we started actually being shot at. So it was so strange. The bus stopped. The bus driver said, I cannot go. You guys come down, get out of the bus and get back to the to the to the, to you know to the first apartment building that was basically um, very close to the bus. So the bus stopped, and then we had to basically call all of us, including my mom and me. We and we got into the first entrance of this apartment building. We knock at the apartment that was at the uh, the first floor, and everyone from the bus got into this apartment. It was so strange. And much, much later, uh, we will never really, I mean, first of all, we never heard, we never will really never know who were the people who shot. No one was really shot. No, there was no blood. But later, later, when I actually went to visit this place again, I could still see the um, traces of the, uh, of the bullets in the, um, in the wall of this apartment building. Why did they shoot at you? Well, that's a very good question. I think it was very much part of the chaos that was meant to be, um, you know, uh, provoked during the so-called revolution. I mean, now we know, right, 30 years later, now we know that the so-called terrorists did not exist, that, in fact, it was much more of a uh, internal um, a coup d'etat. Uh, between the former communists and the more marginal communists who actually were able to to uh, to take power and pretend that they were democratic politicians um and what was revolu- what was revolution and uh, the time where so many people were in fact really shot and killed um this was a chaos that was actually politically uh, provoked it's fairly well accepted that the Ceausescu regime was one of the more, most, if not the most repressive uh, regime in the Soviet bloc. How did it feel in the weeks and months after uh, there'd been that internal civil war and uh, the regime had changed? Well, I think it was important to make a distinction between um, how it felt in provincial small towns like mine and, uh, you know, in uh, important uh, points like uh, Bucharest and other larger cities. Uh, we really lived the revolution, the so-called revolution, vicariously on the, on the TV screen. We were basically glued to the TV screen. Um, and uh, we would really, that's, would, we would, that's what we would do for many weeks uh, for definitely the first month or so, everyone was really watching TV almost nonstop because the TV finally was on non- was on nonstop. Um, I think someone live, who lived in Bucharest at that very same time probably had a totally different experience. Probably there was a much stronger pressure to go in the street. Probably many of them went on the street precisely because of this pressure. Uh, many of them, unfortunately, was shot. Were shot because they actually cho- uh, chose to join the street protest and uh, chose to, um, yeah, to really finally, you know, exercise their right to free speech. At this point, I think we should talk about the the book that you've written um, and about how the authorities used architecture to promote the aims and image of the of the regime. It's a very interesting book, Socialist Heritage, The Politics of Past and Place in Romania. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and, and what you look at in that book? Sure. So the book is, um, uh, first of all, it's an academic book. Uh, it's a, um, what I would call historical, historical ethnography. 
it focuses particularly on one specific place in Romania, and that is a historic neighborhood in Bucharest uh, called uh, the Old Town. And what's very particular about this old town and this neighborhood is that it kept having very distinct uh, political meanings at different moments uh, during the communism and after communism. So I l- look at this neighborhood and I'm trying to understand the broader political changes by the ways in which this neighborhood is becoming valued, is dismissed and then revalued by different political actors, as I said, at different moments. Um, when I talk about the relationship between political agenda and architects, I want to definitely highlight that um, it was a definitely a very sinuous uh, relationship in the sense that there was never necessarily a top down. It was something that, yes, the architects had to really be, um, you know, paying lip service uh, in a political way. But at the same time, more often than not, the politicians had to eventually um, be willing to uh, leave the last, um, you know, the last decision, the final decision to the experts um, in when it comes to when it came to um, the changes in the in the ur- urban fabric uh, and the transformation of cities into socialist cities. So there was a continuous negotiation through all the communist times between the experts and the politicians about how to transform. Uh, much more heterogeneous cities into this pinnacle of socialist modernity. And, and what would the, the pinnacle of socialist modernity look like? Would it look like the house of the people? Is it that kind of grand gesture of a building? Well, I think also this pinnacle of socialist modernity changed according to the times. In the 50s, uh, when the communists came to power in '47, they knew for sure that in order for them to gain you know, to gain legitimacy from the population, a key point for them was to provide housing, to provide cheap and good housing to the workers, to the working class and to to the citizens in general. And uh, the archives are very clear. The primary sources they found, the archives are very clear about that. It was a key priority for the regime. Uh, So pinnacle of socialist modernity at that specific time in the uh, 50s and 60s was to... Um, transform cities that seem to be far too heterogeneous from an aesthetic perspective into something that looked modern, looked clean, linear, functional. Uh, There is a very important change uh, uh, in the 80s when Ceausescu is becoming increasingly uh, dictatorial and therefore um, there is no no more interest in in the needs of the people. So it's a pure dictatorship. They just basically want to really pursue the dream of like showing how grandiose the regime is. And of course, all the resources are actually pumped into this uh, uh, very debated uh, and very controversial um, megalomanic <laughs> uh, apparition, which is uh, the People's House. I read somewhere that you can go on a tour of the House of the People and uh, you'll walk two kilometres on the tour, but you'll only cover 5% of the building in those two kilometres, which must give some measure of the scale uh, of that building. We'll put some information in the show notes um, about that. I think it's now called the Palace of the Parliament, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And I, I think it's also fascinating to think about the symbolical dimension of, of uh, in which um, you know uh, a former symbol of uh, power of the former regime then becomes another symbol of power for the for the basically the so-called uh, you know like it's it's for the, for democracy. Um, so there is, uh, I think, it speaks to some much more subtle continuities between the um, communist regime and the post-communist uh, period. And what's your journey through that landscape uh, from being uh, a young teenager through to um, leaving Romania, ultimately to to follow your career? But how do you plot a route through the changing landscape of Romania in the in the 80s and 90s? Oh, I see. No, uh, yes, I definitely stayed at school in Romania. I basically finished my um 
you know, my first leg of education in Romania before coming to the U.S. to pursue a Ph.D. in anthropology and history. So my educational trajectory was I finished high school. I came to Bucharest for college. I uh, got in uh, and uh, I actually graduated with a major in sociology. Um And then after that, I worked for a few years. I actually worked during college and I also worked after college. Um, And then I I applied uh, for, in fact, to be fully honest, I applied uh, and I got in uh, to pursue a master's uh, at the uh, Central European University in Budapest. And um, so I went there for a year uh, and then from there, I actually applied uh, for pursuing a PhD uh, program in the US. And uh, by that time, my, my English was much better. Uh, I was able to write and speak uh, fluently. And uh, I also was able to rely on a lot of help, institutional help from the professors there um, and the tutors uh, to be able to really um, you know, create strong applications so I would be able to actually pursue this PhD. Did high school change a lot for you um, as you went back to school in January 1990? Was it a very different place or did it keep on going in very much the same vein as before? Yeah, that's actually an interesting question. I think it was a combination. I mean, most of the teachers had actually, right, were the same teachers that taught the same history uh, or the same kind of curriculum before. Um, Some of them were um, definitely very much nostalgic for the new, for the older regime, especially the older ones. I do remember that there were some new teachers who just graduated uh, and then uh, college and then came back to teach. And it was quite a difference between those new teachers or younger teachers who at that time probably were like, what, mid 25, 26, uh, 24. Uh, so they just finished college uh, and the older generation. So, uh, of course, um, yeah, but I don't remember so much. Uh, high school for me was uh, a rather strange time. I was reading a lot. I was very much by myself. So, yeah. When you look back now, I mean, from a perspective of 2020, back at the years that you spent in Romania, what do you feel about that about the country, a country that has, in many respects, a, a, a difficult past? One thinks of the orphanages. Um, how do you feel today, looking back? Well, I think it's important to understand that people also had fun during times that, from outside, seem to be extremely dire. Um, that people really found lots of compromises. In order to, you know, they probably oscillated between continuously finding compromises and trying to live a dignified life. Uh, So this is how I see it from my perspective as an adult now looking back at my parents' generation, for instance. Um, I think also that many people growing up at that time developed a certain kind of resilience uh, that was turned out to be much more helpful lately. Um, but I also feel a deep sadness about especially people and young people who died in 1989 and uh, uh, during the, the, um, the shootings on the street, uh, precisely because there was never um, a serious reckoning with the loss of so many young lives and possible futures that were cut short. So precisely because after 1989, uh, not after 1989, for more than for more than a decade, to be honest, um, many of the people who had been part of the political apparatus before 1989 still hold on, on to positions of power and manage to actually, um, you know, make fortunes with the uh, uh, inside in, inside of information that they had about. Um, about the property of the of the of the former uh, communist state, so so I think it's a kind of a bittersweet feeling that I'm thinking right now that I'm like experiencing right now, looking back at that at that time. Certainly, a lot of what I read about 
Romania, there is always a desire to look forward and not back. Do you think that's uniquely Romanian or is that more general? I think it's um, probably uh, uh, the way in which, uh, you know, any society will have to really find itself into, especially a society that had experienced a very traumatic past. Uh, it has to find a, a middle ground between negotiating the memory of that past and also finding a way to to move forward, right? So the generation f- after me, uh, people who are coming of age right now in Romania, um, based on the conversations I've had with some, especially some children of my friends, um, they are f- finding themselves and thinking of themselves as very, being very much European. Um, they are... Some of them, um, some they have some interest in that communist past. Some others feel it like truly a totally different planet. It has nothing to do with them and with their life and with their generation. So, um, yeah, I think I would say that uh, finding a way to, 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 to reckon with that past but also focus on the future is kind of, it's a more... Uh, general mechanism of uh, social mechanism of coping and it's not necessarily particular to Romania do you go back often yeah in general I try to go there every summer I mean it is my uh, my research uh, uh, place right so I mean I turned the country of my birth into into one of my research sites uh, I have conducted um, a lot of ethnographic research and archival research in many places in Romania Uh, But not in my hometown, I have to say. What is ethnographic research? Uh, Anthropological research, basically field work. Uh, I conducted some uh, interviews, conversations, participant observation. um, Some part of my current project, my second, my future second book, will uh, rely much more on um, field work that I conducted in in two locations in Transylvania uh, a few years ago. Okay. And... I I saw they did some work with some of the Roma community that um, immigrated to the United States. Was Romania a broad ethnic mix while you were growing up there? Yes, so Romania has a long history of being um, one of the countries uh, that... um, included different regions with very different past and also uh, very different ethnic groups, uh, including Roma, uh, but definitely uh, Jews, Armenians, uh, Hungarians, Germans. I'm talking about different regions in Romania right now, right? So Transylvania has a different historic uh, history precisely because it was part of the also Hungarian Empire. Uh, and uh, the Roma in Romania are definitely an important uh, an important group. Unfortunately, uh, it, it is also a group that has been um, radically marginalized uh, politically, economically, socially uh, throughout history. And only now, um, more and more Roma intellectuals and activists are trying to really claim their rights and uh, they are trying to really claim uh, a political visibility uh, for, this, um, for this group. Was there a class structure in Romania? Yeah, what it was, I probably I wouldn't say it was a class structure, but it felt like a class structure. And it was, a, what it was, it was rather a dichotomy. It was between they, what was called they and us. And depending on where you were standing, the, they were the opposite, which means if you were a political, if you were part of the political apparatus, uh, or your parents were part of the political apparatus, they definitely had access to an amazing range of goods and opportunities that were not available, not even the dreams of the ordinary people. So in terms of class, right, there was a, like an allegedly classless society open for the benefit of all. And I have to say, yes, indeed, many people went to school and managed to actually get to have a better life than their parents who were, say, villagers uh, before the Second World War. So it's important to also take that into uh, uh, consideration. At the same time, if you were part of the ordinary citizens, your life became increasingly miserable as the regime 
actually continued to unravel, especially in the late 70s throughout 1980s. I, mean, I think we should mention the, the, the secondhand clothes market um, and the, the shipping of that around. How did that come about and what did it mean for you? So this is definitely a, a very important moment in the early 90s, I would say. I haven't really followed that in terms of research. So I'm just going to be, uh, to be uh, speaking only on my ex- personal experience, based on my personal experience. So the second cloth mar- uh, uh, secondhand clothing market uh, boomed in Romania in early to mid-90s. And that was because suddenly... Um, anyone would be able to really find a great pair of jeans, a, 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 like a really nice, barely worn, uh, or more like like <laughs> more worn uh, leather jacket, um, and uh, you would pay uh, not so much for it. And just putting it on felt like you would really, you know, feel closer to the West. And that's very important for generations who were not able to leave the country, who were not able to really just even imagine that they would ever uh, visit Western Europe, just wearing that pair of jeans that looked great and not be known, you know, your deep heart that basically was worn by a Westerner was quite something. It was quite a, quite a political performativity, if I, if I put it this way, an academic way. So you could feel you could relate to what was going on outside of the country, I guess. Right, right. I mean, I do. I have a very special story. So I definitely, I was dying to have a pair of jeans. Uh, and then there was the first second uh, hand clothing uh, shop that appeared in my town. And my grandma gave me some money uh, and I basically w- uh, used them all that money to buy the second hand pair of jeans, which were great. <laughs> and so I was super happy. I went back to her and I told her, Grandma, look what great jeans I got. And she was like, I cannot believe you. You wasted my money, you know, hardly one money uh, on a second hand, you know, uh, clothing. Basically, she she would not understand why would I really waste so much money on something that had been worn before. Whereas for me, it was like fantastic in so many ways. It was it had been worn by a Westerner before. They look great. I look great. <laughs> Everything was perfect. I I visited the USSR in eighty seven, and it's interesting what we thought was a commodity. You know, a knockoff copy of a Top Gun. Uh, cassette uh, or an old pair of jeans uh-huh. was suddenly in such high demand and mm-hmm. they were sort of it for the stuff that we wanted that was you know commoditized to them you know a massive uh, Soviet flag or a, I think maybe even a uh-huh. bottle of vodka would have, would have uh, changed hands you know mm-hmm. it was it's mm-hmm. interesting because I think that people always want what they can't have yeah probably yeah I mean this was basically took years and decades of of uh of longing right longing for longing for something that uh you could only barely get a glimpse of just if you were able to see a western magazine or a burda or you know this kind of german catalogs um so yeah absolutely (laughs) what was on romanian tv up before 89 was it a very uh, dry diet oh of yes, state. Yes, I do remember, uh, and that's why when I said that I was, um, I was checking the watch at the moment of the uh, when I found out that the regime f- collapsed, was that they would have only news from twelve to one to two. That's it. Two hours of television of news about what Ceausescu did and how grand he is and everything about him, basically. Uh, there was the only thing that was in, in, indeed interesting was a one hour per Saturday, uh, on uh, every Saturday evening, um, which was a certain kind of combination of short documentaries. With edu- it was basically educational uh, material. And it, in Romanian, it was called Tele Encyclopedia, which is basically the TV encyclopedia. And they would really have short documentaries about various kinds of things, uh, especially play. So it was profoundly apolitical. And precisely because it was so profoundly apolitical, as long as it was about, you know, geological times or things that would not be connected to recent history, uh, it would pass. And so it would pass 
to censorship and everyone will be able to finally see something that had no political um, dimension whatsoever. But there were, there were no imported TV shows. Uh, there were some cartoons. <laughs> for, uh, there were some actually Soviet cartoons. Um, and uh, they were pretty funny. <laughs> Um, lots, uh, some, some Russian movie, uh, some Soviet movies. I'm sorry. Um, I also don't remember so much because basically there was so little that you could see that you basically would not really turn on the TV. Uh, that's why I was really reading a lot because there wasn't really much to see. Um, it was not, I wouldn't call it television. It was just basically somehow, <laughs> I don't know, like a portal to political ideology in full display, uh, interspersed with some documentaries about, I don't know, Pleistocene from time to time. That's a good description of what it was on the, on, and it was also, of course, only one channel. So yeah, that was what so-called television was in communist Romania, my time. I wanted to say that I actually ended up writing a poem <laughs> for Ceausescu, <laughs> which was published. Um, and that piece of that poem was so strange uh, because I didn't really realize it was published. And then a teacher came to me with, uh, there was this very specific uh, magazine meant for the pioneers. And then they said, is this you? <laughs> Was it was it an apolitical poem or was it very political? What 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 did you say in it? So so it was a praising Ceausescu because I think it's fascinating to think of how ideology works for kids' minds. So I right I knew he was really a dictator. Maybe I wasn't really using that term, but I knew it was pretty bad. At the same time, I would go to this literary circle where we would just write poems. And I would write a poem about birds and like various kinds of plants and things that were not political. But then I also wrote about a poem about Ceausescu because I also um, saw other poems written by other kids about Ceausescu. It was a kind of the equivalent of the Lego competition then, right? And so I submitted those poems and uh, they ignored the poem about the birds, which I thought it was excellent. <laughs> but they, po they posted the poem about Ceausescu. So not only are you a published academic, but you're also a published <laughs> socialist poet. Unfortunately, I have to. I have to own it. Yes, definitely. Do you have the poem with you? I don't remember it, and I don't think my mom kept it. So, oh, no. shame. shame! Yeah, I do. I do remember one thing though that I actually used. You know, like kids' poems. I used specifically uh, one line where I said something about his. <laughs> His uh, feverish mind in Romanian, it's actually Minta Infierbantata, which can also be actually really uh, interpreted as basically you are, you know, inebriated. Yeah. <laughs> and they changed it to his, um, his uh, flower like mind, which in Romanian is Minta uh, Inflorita. So there was a very important uh, editing, uh, you know, element there that they had to really change. But yeah, I, do, I, I will always remember that. That was kind of pathetically funny. How can I put it? But this way. It's such a shame that you haven't got a copy of that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I can find it. I'm sorry. <laughs> It'll be in some archive somewhere. I'm sure. I think uh, if I can go to the to the National Library of Romania, and I, uh, I actually, I, I also have to remember which year, because I was probably 11-ish, yeah. sometime like that, 11, 12, because it's when I was going to this literary circle. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> <Creating. n> <laughs> now we know why your grandparents got to keep their house, because you wrote poems <laughs> praising <laughs> Ceausescu. That's the, that's the hidden connection. Yeah, exactly. That's the hidden connection. It took me so many decades to finally put the two and two together. There's further information such as photos and videos in our episode notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.
Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.